everyone, Jade here. What if I told you that the observation of a white shoe can support the hypothesis that all ravens are black? You'd probably think I was talking complete nonsense, right? And to be fair, that's a pretty reasonable response. What could a white shoe possibly have to do with all ravens being black? <laughs> well, this is a video about a phenomenon called the Raven Paradox. It came about in the early 20th century when a hopeful group of scientists and philosophers were trying to understand the world. They called themselves the logical empiricists, and as the name suggests, they thought the only things you needed to understand the world were logic and empiricism, which is basically observations of the world we all agree on. In a nutshell, their philosophy was that any meaningful statement about the world could be understood by looking at the world, that's the empiricist part, and then we could use logic to make conclusions. The name the logical empiricist gave their way of understanding the world might be familiar to some of you. It's called the scientific method. And as you can imagine, it's greatly influenced the way that we think about science. But things didn't go as smoothly as they imagined as the Raven paradox soon flew into the face of their neat little method. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll see that the ways that we go about doing science aren't always as straightforward as you might think. To demonstrate this, let's take inspiration from the logical empiricists and try to do some science with just logic and empiricism. Imagine you have the hypothesis, all ravens are black. It seems like a reasonable hypothesis to make, right? So as a logical empiricist, what kind of steps would you take to investigate this hypothesis? Well, to gather some empirical evidence, you could go out into the world and simply find some ravens check the color of their feathers and see if they're black. So you do this and every raven you find is black. This is good news for your hypothesis. Logical empiricism tells us that with every new black raven you see, you should become more confident in your hypothesis that all ravens are black. So now that we've gathered some empirical evidence, it's time to introduce some logic. Basic inference and deduction tells us that the fact that we've only seen black ravens supports our hypothesis that all ravens are black. We can formalize this logic by saying, observing lots of A's with property B supports the hypothesis that all A's are B. We can replace A with raven and B with black, or we can replace them with anything for that matter, and that logic should still hold. Now we can use the rules of logic to change this statement in such a way so that it is logically equivalent. What I mean by logically equivalent is that there could be two sentences that look different on the surface but are really saying the same thing. For example, the two sentences, I'll meet you at the cafe at noon, and I'll see you at the shop which sells coffee when the sun is highest in the sky. One might sound a little bit weird, but ultimately they mean the same thing. They're logically equivalent. To make this clearer, it's often really helpful to draw Venn diagrams to help visualize what we're saying. Let's draw a circle to represent all black things and another disconnected circle to represent all non-black things. Remember our original hypothesis is that all ravens are black, which means that, assuming our hypothesis is true, ravens only exist in the all black things circle. But if we stop and think about it for a second, we can see that it's logically equivalent to say that there are no ravens in the non-black circle. Or in other words, all non-black things are not ravens. All ravens are black is logically equivalent to saying all non-black things are not ravens. If you're not convinced, take a bit of time to let this sink in because this should be a non-controversial statement. Now, can you think of a non-black, non-raven? Well, what about a white shoe? It fits the description. It's not black, it's white, and it's not a raven, it's a shoe. Now let's apply some inductive logic. Take the same formally logical statement from before. Observations of A with property B support the hypothesis that all A's are B. We can replace A with non-black things and B with not ravens. So the observation of a white shoe gives support to the statement, all non-black things are not ravens. But hang on a minute, 
we showed that the statement all non-black things are not ravens is logically equivalent to the statement all ravens are black. So we can swap it in without changing the meaning of the sentence. And what do we get? An observation of a white shoe gives support to the hypothesis that all ravens are black. Now I don't know about you, but I don't remember the last time a bird scientist published their results on the observation of white shoes. And I like to keep up with my bird science. But all we used to construct our argument was logic and empiricism. So what went wrong? This is the question that puzzled philosophers <clears throat> This is the question that puzzled philosophers of science for years and still does today. There are many responses to the paradox, but here I'll give the three most well-known ones. And who knows, they may even inspire you to come up with a theory of your own. One potential response, which our logical empiricist friend Carl Hempel actually gave, is to just bite the bullet and say that an observation of a white shoe does help confirm the hypothesis that all ravens are black, even if only by a minuscule amount end of story. The advantage of this response is that the scientific method stays safely intact and there is no paradox. But it doesn't really gel with our intuition of how the world works. Philosopher of science Nelson Goodman said that if this approach were true, we could do a lot of indoor ornithology. In other words, we could sit in comfy armchairs and further the study of birds by pointing at colourful objects. Not only that, but if you think about it, an observation of a white shoe also helps confirm the hypothesis that all ravens are blue, or green, or purple. Let's see what other options there are. The next response comes from another famous name in the philosophy of science, Karl Popper. His approach to science can basically be summed up as The job of science and the scientific method is to show whether or not a hypothesis is wrong. That's it. This idea of showing something as false using observation is called falsifiability, and it's what Popper thought was the key feature of a scientific hypothesis. On the surface, this seems like a reasonable way of looking at science. It always leaves us open to the possibility that we might be wrong. But if we look a bit closer, things get a bit funny. Remember when we said that many observations of black ravens would support our hypothesis that all ravens are black? Well, Popper completely disagreed with this approach. He thought the business of science was to falsify theories and only falsify them, not make us more confident in anything being true. An observation of a white shoe wouldn't support the hypothesis that all ravens are black, but neither would a black raven. To Popper, the notion of support or confirmation was not the way science should operate. If all we find are black ravens, all this means is that our hypothesis is yet to be falsified. This last response, I must tell you, is the one I agree with most, just so you know my biases up front. It has to do with the context surrounding an observation. Let's demonstrate this with some strange but instructive examples. Imagine you have someone come up to you and say, behind my back is a raven. Would you like me to show it to you? You're a bit creeped out, but as someone interested in the hypothesis, all ravens are black, you should say yes, since if it's a blue or purple raven, that would refute your hypothesis. Popper would be proud. Now imagine someone comes up to you and says, behind my back, I have a black object. Would you like me to show it to you? You figure the people here are just a bit weird, so you go to say yes. But if you think about it for a minute, whatever is behind their back could never refute the hypothesis that all ravens are black, since even if it is a black raven, not much would be learned since you knew the object was going to be black given the circumstance. Finally, a more subtle example. Imagine a third person comes up to you and says, behind my back is a non-black object. Would you like me to show it to you? Here, you should definitely say yes, since it could be a blue raven, which could refute your hypothesis. But if this person pulls out a white shoe, in a roundabout way, it gives support to your hypothesis that all ravens are black, since given the particular situation, a different outcome could have refuted it. But the crucial point to make here is whether or not we care about the observation of a white shoe depends on the wider context. If this person said they have a non-raven behind their back, 
then pulling out a white shoe should not matter to you in the slightest, since we only care about ravens, whereas you should care if they say they have a non-black object, since then it has the chance to be a non-black raven. So the takeaway with this response is that sometimes a white shoe does add confidence to your hypothesis, and sometimes it doesn't. You need more information about how the observation was carried out to make that call. So they're just three theories about how the raven paradox could potentially be resolved. The historical development after the advent of the logical empiricist was incredibly fascinating, with its fair share of heated disagreements and skirmishes between scientists and philosophers. Some had more radical approaches to the scientific method, like Paul Feyerbend's total rejection of any kind of universal methodology, complete scientific anarchy. Other approaches, like Bayesian analysis, were developed and are still being widely used to this day, but that is a topic for another video. What the Raven Paradox tells me personally is that you can't remove science from the specific context in which it's done, even in principle and especially in practice. I think this paradox serves as a really good introduction to the counterintuitive intricacies of the scientific method. It challenges our assumptions about how science is done, and in doing so, makes us understand it and hopefully appreciate it all the more. But I want to know what you think. Does the observation of a white shoe support the hypothesis that all ravens are black? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Being exposed to paradoxes and brain teasers like this is great for improving your lateral thinking and training your powers of reasoning. But what's even better is trying to answer these problems yourself. With today's sponsor, Brilliant, you can do just that. Their daily challenges are a fun and interactive way to improve your problem solving skills. This one was one of my favorites as I've always been fascinated by the unintuitive nature of probability and how numbers can be so sneaky. I've found that trying to answer questions is the best way to learn because it forces you to truly think about the problem. If you want to know more about any challenge, you can click on the accompanying course where you'll find similar questions and helpful explanations for when you get stuck. Brilliant has loads of courses available in math, physics, and computer science. They're all interactive, complete with fun questions like how phase synchronization of oscillators helps firefly courtship, or how to get the best hand at blackjack. All their courses are available in offline mode so you can get deep into concentration. If you want to support Up and Atom and get unlimited access to all of Brilliant's in-depth math and science courses, head over to brilliant.org slash upandatom to get 20% off their annual premium subscription. I'm doing my first ever live stream to celebrate the channel reaching 100,000 subscribers. It's going to be on the 19th of May, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll also be reminding you guys about it on my social media, so make sure to follow me on there as well. It'd be awesome if you could make it along. You'll get to see how awkward I am in real life when I don't have any prepared lines to say. It's probably going to be a Q&A, so nothing too exciting. Um, if you have any suggestions of things I can do to make it interesting, please leave them in the comments below. I feel like I need to entertain. Anyway, that's the end of the video. Thanks for watching. Bye.